was raised in the Jim Crow South, and I was initiated into racism and bigotry at the age of six on a Greyhound bus. My mother told me that I had to sit in the back row area that was designated for colors, but I wanted to sit in the front row area because we had passed an old white lady who had a basket of colorful yarns in her lap. And when I thought my mother was not looking or was asleep, I proceeded to walk forward to the front row area. I got stink eye from the white passengers. I looked up in the mirror and the bus driver was doing the same. My mother scolded me severely. She said, don't you ever do that anymore. You sit back here where the colors are supposed to sit and don't you move. Well, I was supposed to have learned my place because of my racial identity. When I was in ninth grade, I learned that my school was going to be integrated. And I was shocked. But mostly I was scared. I was scared because the older people in the neighborhood had been saying that, did you hear about the Little Rock Nine? Those nine black kids in Little Rock, Arkansas, who integrated Central High School. Did you know that the white students would come up behind them and they would spit on them? They would call them nigger. They would push them up against the locker. And the National Guard, who toted guns on their shoulders, had to walk these kids into class. Well, it didn't quite happen like that for me. Instead, I had to take a look at what was happening in the classroom. I had to put eyes in the back of me so I could see what was going on around me at all times. When I raised my hand in class to answer a question or to even ask a question, I was giggled at by the white students. And the teacher would allow it in a classroom with a ratio of, say, two black students to 28 white students. I knew the first day when I stepped over that teacher's threshold that I was a disgust and disdain to that teacher for being in the education system. And to top it all off, I was having a racial identity crisis and still trying to be a teenager at the same time. I recall that I would go into the gymnasium for assemblies and I would make sure that I was last so that the two races would voluntarily seat themselves and I would sit in between the races. I felt better there. I didn't know what the black students uh, were talking about other than picking fights, and I was upholding the values of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And the white students, I had no idea what was going on with them because they rejected me. I would daydream and I would go back into a time when I was a little girl and I was given a white baby doll at Christmas. And I loved that little white baby doll. I would take naps with that baby doll. And now being in the integrated school system, I was thinking, why do the white people hate me? Well, 
hearing in college that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had been assassinated, my jaw was dropping. Another African-American friend and I, we sat outside on a ledge watching the students go into the classroom. And we were upset, confused, and were really sad. How could anybody murder such a wonderful human being who stood up for nonviolence, for the benefit of people of color, for jobs and for opportunities? Well, my mother said, keep on keeping on. And it was hard to do. She said, keep your head up high. And don't you give up. I did not give up. By senior year in college, I would listen to the various black movements on campus. And there were leaders that were coming in. And they were speaking in such an authoritative and confident manner about being an African American that I said, I'm done with this racial identity crisis. And I became empowered. I own my African-American identity as a woman. And 30 plus years later, my family of various skin tones after a lot of processing and transformation. And they represent three continents. Historically, people of color have been captured, beaten, raped. Kids have been separated from their parents permanently, families separated permanently, considered less than personal property, was listed sometimes with the first name maybe, but with maybe a cow or wagon. And even after slavery, with the rise of the civil rights movement in America, thank goodness for it, there's still hate, discriminations, and old racial identities that are still popping up. They show up in strange ways, even with, we're not inviting those people to our kids' wedding. After all, what will our parents think? What will our new in-laws think? And the people at the clubhouse? Or the proud fellow who says, they're bickering over me because I've been here only one year and I've got the raise and the promotion. And I deserve it. After all, my grandfather was the dean here 50 years ago. Or the employer who says, why do they keep applying with names like that? I know their ethnicities. I'm not going to hire them. So how do kids learn this sort of thing? Recalling being in a grocery store or a supermarket, I have felt eyes upon me. I turn, and it's the eyes of a little white child staring at my legs or my face. I turn to smile back at the child, and the child doesn't notice because the child is just still staring. And along comes his mom, picks the child up. They go off down the aisle, and I hear her saying, shh, shh, shh. It's impolite to stare. And the child is trying to say something to her. 
and I can't hear the rest because they're gone off. And the child's looking back at me and I'm looking at the child in contrast to the mother who sees what's happening to her child with me and in that engagement and she starts a conversation with me. Why do they have that, those gluten-free items on that top shelf? I wonder. And the child ignores me, starts playing with his mom's grocery cart. So in which scenario do you think a child learns something positive about someone with dark skin? Well, we know inequities exist, so it's time that we do something new. And I would like for all of you to participate with me, physically or just imagine it. Because I would like for you to participate in this metaphor story of breaking ground. And we're going to break ground to plant new racial identities. I would invite you to do that. And there's land and soil underneath the building, out of the field or garden. Just imagine that this is where you are. And you're holding a shovel in your hand. Let's imagine we're holding a shovel in our hands. And we're going to put our foot on the shovel. Or you can just imagine it. But do be with me in this story. I would love for you to participate. And on the count of three, let's see if we can break ground. One, two, three. Yes, thank you. Ground is broken. There's a lot of soil that's empty. And it needs to be supplied with nutrients, something that's alive. What could we put there? Compost. Those old racial identities that have shown up that we talked about, and some that we didn't that are on this shovel. Whiter is brighter keep justifying, and why don't they talk like me? And plus the ones that I talked about, and they go on and on. This will help to nourish the soil. It will aerate it and help to retain the water. And now it's time to plant the seeds. These are seeds. These are action seeds. Seeds that I would like for you to take on. Take on one of these seeds. Take on two of them if you would like. I invite you to do that. Be the seed that speaks up. Speak up when you hear about comments and, and say put downs about ethnicities and people of other races that are inappropriate. Don't let your children or your, your co-workers or your families get away with that. Definitely not your children because your children can continue with this, and bullying can be per perpetuated in the schools because of differences. Be the educator. Educate someone. Give someone an anonymous scholarship, if you would like. And wouldn't it be nice if we could figure out a way that we could create a system where people could be educated, have a free education and free training? That would solve a lot of inequities. A lots of inequities. Be the seller, S-E-L-L, -L, real estate, to anyone in any neighborhood, eliminating the railroad tracks, the levees, the rivers that divide. Get to know everybody. Get to know people. Let's have a nice, wonderful community of people all over. And if you can open a door for someone, someone, that you've not even thought about opening a door for, feel free to do that. Someone different than you would ordinarily choose. And now we cover the ground. Ground has been covered. And these seeds are going to grow. But we're going to take a peek at the, these seeds. In the community where I grew up on a farm, this is called crop lay-by time, a time for the seeds to grow. A time when you did a lot of extra chores is what it really meant for me. <sighs> Let's take a peek. Look at that. These seeds are getting larger. They're going to surface soon. But they're earthworms. They're earthworms below the surface. 
and they're going after something. I hear them eating hate, fear, shame, self-criticism, pain, all those things that come up when we deal with racism or racial identity. A lot of this is embedded, embedded beneath the surface here of the soil. Could it be embedded in us? If so, let's imagine that earthworms are transforming it to become rich nutrients and super fertilizer. And now the plants have grown all green, one color. But if you look at them, they're different as we as humans are different. But now we have powerful humans because we have had the earthworms to get rid of the garbage, I would call it, that that's embedded, that perpetuates situations that I talked about. We came here fresh like this when we were born. And we have forgotten, we have forgotten our true humanity. We have forgotten to exemplify it. Being humane is our new racial identity that we broke ground to plant. So if you may please be the seeds, and if you can please put your humanity into action on a daily basis, creating a ripple effect like a pebble being tossed into the water, expanding our humanity to others, reaching far and wide. Thank you.